Awesome. Well, if I haven't met you before, my name is Josh, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Evangel, and we are kicking off a new series today called Man of the People. And we've been studying Jesus in the book of Luke, written by the man, the Dr. Luke, and he writes about the life and the miracles and the ministry of Jesus. As, and as we start this new series here in October, Jesus is kind of taking a pivot. He's not just going around the countryside and doing miracles and teaching in synagogues and gathering a following, but now Jesus has a following. Thousands, hundreds of people are gathering around him and hearing his teaching or watching him do miracles. And now Jesus takes a, a new paradigm and he begins to apply it to those that are following him. This would be the religious leaders of the day. This would be the Jewish people that were living in Israel at the time. This would be his disciples who next week we'll see him call 12 apostles who would be the future of the church. And really in Luke chapter 6, what I'm going to open up today, uh, Jesus takes some time to tell people about the old law, the law that we find in the old covenant or what's called the Torah in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he explains why the old law is now worn out and there's a new law that is coming. And I'm gonna explain that more in just a moment. But in this explanation in Luke chapter six, he says, number one, there's a new Sabbath. Number two, there's a new nation. And number three, there's a new blessing for those that follow me. He's really saying the old law is worn out and I'm establishing a new, or a better word would be a greater law because Jesus didn't abolish the old law. He established a new law and he fulfilled the old law. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say law, don't worry, I got you. I'm gonna get into it in just a moment. So if you have a Bible, I'm in Luke chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen, or you can download the YouVersion Bible app and follow along. Luke chapter 6, verse 1, the message is titled, The Best Rest. The Best Rest. Here we go. It says, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off the heads of grain, rubbed the husks in their hands, and ate the grain. But some of the Pharisees, or religious leaders of the Jewish sect, said, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests could eat. He also gave some to his companions. And Jesus added, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue or the Jewish place of worship while Jesus was teaching. The leaders of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath, something that would have broken the Old Testament law found in the first five books of the Bible. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. Then Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? And he looked around at them one by one, and then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. And at this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. The Bible explains it further in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, when it says, so there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. There is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. He's not talking about resting from just physical activity. He's talking about a greater kind of rest. Those that rest from their labors, just as God did after creating the world, now we need to enter that rest. He's talking about the laboring of trying to inherit salvation on your own. 
He's, tra- he's talking about the laboring of trying to live a good religious life or, or doing enough good works that you might be able to go to heaven. He's, he's talking about that kind of laboring ceasing for a different kind of rest that God wants to establish in the hearts of his people. A few years ago, uh, my wife Janae and I had a newborn. We had our first child. And we were doing the normal rhythm of getting up in the middle of the night and living through the days uh, in a series of delirious living, of not really being able to contemplate what was going on around us because we were tired in a way we had never been tired before. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And so there was one night where the baby cried and Janae got up and she went into his room. It was about 1 a.m. And uh, as she was in the room, she heard a stirring or she heard some noise outside our, our child's bedroom window. And so she pulled back the curtain and she looked down the street. And uh, as she looked, there was a man actively breaking into our neighbor's car. The thing is, when she pulled the curtain back on the window, the light that was on in our son's room radiated out into the darkness, and the person breaking into the car stopped what they were doing and looked up at the window and made eye contact with Janae. Now her skin is crawling, you know? After that, it gets worse because he stopped tampering with the car. He ran across our driveway and up the side of our house. So Janae comes wildly into our room, wakes me up, I'm delirious, I, I like get out of bed and start running and run into a wall, I didn't actually, but that's what it felt like I could do, realizing that now there's, there's somebody who is willing to break into things that's on the exact opposite of the wall that I'm, I'm next to at that moment, and needless to say, we were freaked out. Every window I looked out, I was expecting to see this face like appear in the window, I'm like, should we just get the baby and lock down in our room? And I don't know what to do. So I, I, I called the cops, and, and they came, and, and we, were, we, were, we were just having every thought that you, that you could have about what could happen, or what does it mean that the person saw Janae's face? You know, is he going to be mad that she knows who he is? And, uh, and for several minutes, we just kind of lived in that state of what's happening? What, where is this person? What's going on? And uh, eventually, we saw a, a cop car come down the street, and then uh, a few minutes later, we saw the guy skateboard down the street behind the cop. We were like, okay, well, that's still not exactly what we'd hope, but, <laughs> but we knew at least he was off our property, and, uh, and we don't know what happened from there, but uh, we laid da- the baby down uh, in his crib, and of course, the baby slept like a baby through the whole thing. And we laid back down in bed and both just stared at the ceiling for a while, listening for any noise that might be happening in the house. And uh, rest was hard to come by for a few hours. If you've been in a situation like that, you, you play out scenarios in your mind and, and fear can quickly enter in. I don't know, maybe you're braver than me, but uh, I was, I, I, it was a few hours before rest really settled in on our bodies and we were able to sleep again. And I think about these people that are surrounding Jesus in this story, and they're not looking for physical rest. In fact, many of them might have slept really well the night before. They were in the synagogue listening to this man Jesus teach, like a rabbi, a Jewish teacher would have taught. But they were searching for something. We find that that while they may have had physical rest, they were looking for a spiritual kind of rest. That as, as the physical body experiences rest, through sleep, the spiritual body or the spirit or the soul of a person is always searching for where its rest comes from. And come on, I know there's many of you that slept last night, but your soul has not slept in a long time. Or you haven't had rest for your soul in a long time. It's been a, a constant battle of, of inner nerves and frustration and anxiety and turmoil. And I want you to know today that Jesus offers rest for your soul. That he offers rest not just for the physical, but also for the spiritual. Why couldn't these people rest? What was it about them or that they were walking through that, that they hadn't discovered the kind of rest? Why did Jesus teach them about a different kind of rest? How does that rest apply to us today? See, I know there's people that live in turmoil, and I know that some of you have have turned towards addiction or towards a substance or towards relationships or towards pornography or towards other things in your life to try to satisfy the unrest in your soul, to try to kind of self-medicate what's going on 
inside of your person. And I want you to know today that there's a better way. That there's a better way. That Jesus didn't just come telling us what we should do and what we should not do, but he offered us the gift of his rest. And he offered us the gift of salvation or the saving of our souls, the peace that comes from knowing him. See, the Jews, the Jewish people at that time had been the people of God. In the Old Testament, in, Matthew, or in, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the way through, they'd been the people of God and sometimes they strayed away and sometimes they lived according to the covenant that God had given them. There was a covenant that they had in their relationship with God and it's called the law. It was given down uh, from God to Moses on Mount Sinai. It includes the Ten Commandments. There's aspects of that law that you and I still observe today. Why? Because Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior came and he fulfilled the law and he took some things from the law and he brought them into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way through to Revelation. And he said, these things still matter. What you observe then still matters, but the rest of the law is fulfilled. So you and I don't sacrifice animals anymore. We don't take the excrement from the camp and carry it outside the camp and dump it like they did. We, that law has been fulfilled. It, it completed what it was meant to do for the time that it was established. But Jesus came and he established a new covenant between God and his people. He established a, a new, or you could say, a greater law. The International Bible Society talks about it this way. It says in the New Testament or the time of Jesus, the law refers back to that old situation when people looked at obedience to the commandments as the way of acceptance with God. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, often contrasts this with the forgiven state believers in Christ now enjoy because of God's grace. No longer because of the keeping of commandments, but now because of the grace of God. Paul loves to make that contrast between the impossible situation of trying to merit forgiveness on your own and the new situation of forgiveness by the sheer mercy of God because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. That's why his death and resurrection on the cross, or his death on the cross and his resurrection or rising from the dead is so powerful. See, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, not only, they didn't just find their rest in the law, but they found their rest in the religious uh, leadership and the religious control that they gained from the law. So the Pharisees try to find rest in their own religious tradition. And it's here that a portion of the law comes into discussion. Because Jesus now is encouraging, or he's demonstrating, that it's more important to do good for a person than to keep the Old Testament law that says don't work on the Sabbath. Not that, not that you and I should work seven days a week and just work ourselves to death, but he's saying there's a greater law, and that greater law is to do good to people around you. The greater law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So while the old law is fulfilled, Jesus establishes a new law, and the issue here is harvesting on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, working on the Sabbath, something that would have been a breach of what the rabbis taught, a breach of the Jewish law, religious law up to that time. And really, the reality that the Christ, the Messiah, the one that had been prophesied or told about in the Old Testament law, is standing in front of them as the Son of God and the Son of Man, declaring a new law. Their rejection of that is evidence that in actuality, they cared more about their religious system than they did about the God of that religious system. They cared more about lording over other people than about the Lord God that they were supposed to be serving. They were obligated to a system rather than to the Lord of that system or the God of that system. See, part of the, the law was how they celebrated a day of physical rest. The seventh day was and remains sacred in the Jewish faith today. It's the Sabbath, or when we were in, uh, when we were in Israel, they called it Shabbat. People would say Shabbat Shalom. It was the, the, the day of rest. It comes from the idea that God rested on the seventh day of creation after creating all things. 
It's this reality that God gave Israel the Sabbath law or this idea on Mount Sinai when the law was passed down to Moses. Some rabbis or Jewish teachers taught that the Messiah, which we know is Christ, but they did not recognize Christ, many of them as the Messiah, and many still don't today, could not come until Israel had perfectly kept the Sabbath. So not only are they saying the Sabbath is important, they're saying the Messiah that we're all waiting for won't even come until all of us keep it together. It was hugely important to their personal lives and to their religious tradition and to the Jewish state nationally. We were in Israel during uh, Shabbat or during the Sabbath and we went to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall uh, on Shabbat. And as our tour guide was teaching, some people were taking notes and we were asked to stop taking notes because that's work, and on Shabbat, we shouldn't work. Uh, Some were taking pictures, and they said, don't take pictures, because on the Sabbath, pressing a button on a camera is work, and we're supposed to cease from that on the Sabbath. We were at the hotel in the elevator. You couldn't push a button to go to a certain floor. It went to every floor. It stopped on every floor on its way up and down, so nobody would have to work by pushing a button. Uh, the, The water machine that pumped out cool water every other day of the week pumped out lukewarm water on that day because uh, not wanting to use the electricity or the work on the Sabbath. The gelato stores were closed on the Sabbath. (laughs) Most devastating news of all. And uh, they still observe it today, the Jewish people do, and it really establishes for us this idea of the Lord's Day or this idea of the Sabbath. And while the Sabbath is important, it's not as sacred as doing good to your neighbor. The the greater law that Jesus came establishing in this story, see the larger question here, that Jesus finds himself in conflict with the religious leaders and those around him wasn't really about the Sabbath. It was really about the use of the law, of the Old Testament law. What do we do with it now? If Jesus is the Christ, if he's the Messiah, if he fulfilled the law and he's bringing a new covenant between God's people and God, then then what do we do with this old law? And this didn't just exist in the time of Jesus. Even the early church after Christ wrestled with what to do with the law. We see it in uh, Acts 15, in Romans 7, in Galatians 4. The use and the priority of the law continues to be addressed. We see the Apostle Paul reprimand Peter, one of the original disciples of Jesus, for his misuse of the law. And trying to call people into religious tradition rather than calling them to follow Christ and the grace that comes from knowing him. It's the, it was in the early church, it was in the time of Jesus, and it exists still today that you and I seek to find rest for our souls through the power of the law or the power of religious tradition or the power of our own works. We, we get away from our salvation being in Christ alone and faith in him, and we begin to try to work up our own righteousness, or we begin to try to fulfill religious duties, or if I just read my Bible more, God will be pleased with me, or if I just would pray a little longer like that person, then God would maybe love me a little bit more. Man, I want you to know today that that's not the grace of Jesus, that all of those things can and will happen out of a heart overflowing for love for God. But our identity in Christ is not established because of our own work or our own religious tradition or observance. The only way that you moved closer to God by coming to church today was not by the act of coming to church. It was through the act of what God will speak in your heart and what you will obey because you came to church. It's the difference. The Bible tells us that we're saved by grace through faith, not by our works, but our works are an overflow of having faith in Christ Jesus. It's a greater law that Jesus is instituting, that God, God's law today is based on grace, not on sacrifices. And it was so profound in their time and such a disruption to the religious order of the day And it's still a disruption to the religious order of some today that people rejected the Messiah for it. And it still exists today that people proclaim to follow Jesus but are just following religious duty and are actually rejecting the grace that came from knowing him. And if anybody ever tells you that you have to do this and this and this to go to heaven, they're wrong. 
and they're lying to you, or they're giving you a lack of truth, the only way that you and I come to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. Not by any other work of man, not by any other work of our own hands, but it's by faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And we lose our spiritual rest when we rely on our own works or we rely on religious duty to obtain a sense of rest. The the man with the deformed hand, he got it. The disciples, they began to understand it, that our rest comes in Christ and Christ alone. That spiritual rest for the person comes in Jesus. And if you've been in turmoil or if you've carried a weight into this room today, or you're watching online and and something's going on in your life that caused you to not even want to be in church, and I want you to know that Jesus offers a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, that he came, that he died, and he rose again, and he, he is the answer to the salvation for your soul, then you have an opportunity to enter in to that rest. See, Jesus in this story is reinterpreting the Old Testament law. He had the ability to do that because a rabbi, as respected in Jewish society, which is at this point what Jesus is functioning and accepted as, could not only read scripture or the law, but they had the power to interpret it for everyday living, to interpret how it affected everyday life. And so Jesus talks about the Sabbath, the Old Testament law, and then he makes this declaration, which is what we call a Christological expression. And he says in Luke 6, chapter 5, the Son of Man is Lord. You got to watch this. The Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. What is he saying? I and my authority are greater than your religious tradition. Me and my authority and he's, he's forcing them to say, is Jesus just some crazy prophet trying to mess up the religious order of the day? Or is he the son of man and the son of God who has the ability to say, I am greater than the law that was established by God because I'm the originator of it. And now I've come teaching a new law. See, the, the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath, he's establishing that his authority is greater than the traditions and the systems of mankind, even the law that he, being fully God and fully man, had established and now came to fulfill and establish a greater law. And that greater law that Jesus established is this, that God is more concerned about meeting human needs than he is about protecting human rules. God is more concerned about meeting human needs than he is about protecting human rules. If you've ever heard something said like, man, that person really shouldn't act that way in church. You've lost the meaning of church. And you've lost the meaning behind why we do church. It's about the needs of the people of God more than religious behavior or religious observance or protecting human rules and man-established traditions. It's about people. This gospel of Jesus is about people. And Jesus was willing to disrupt everything in order to establish a greater law that said more than God desires sacrifice, he desires compassion. More than he desires sacrifice, he desires Mercy, he says it in Hosea 6, chapter 6, in Matthew 9, 13. God desires compassion or mercy, not sacrifice. He's saying the new way is to do good, that doing good is greater than the law. He's saying it was better that David's men broke the law by walking through the field and eating than it was for them to not eat and starve to death. He's saying it's better that a man with a a, a deformed hand can come into the house of God and experience the power and the presence of Jesus versus having to be sent away to come back another day out of religious rule and regulation. It's better that somebody would experience Christ, that you would love them than it is for you to slam them down with your religious tradition and rules. We see it happen still to this day that people are overlooked for the sake of the system. And God cares about people. And churches need to rally around, I'm on a soapbox, churches need to rally around 
the needs of people and the hurts of people. Because man, the record that I see of Jesus is everybody that the religious order of the day avoided, he sought out. (laughs) Over and over and over again. The people that the religious rules said, man, they're so far from God, I can't believe they would act that way. They don't even deserve to be in the presence of Jesus. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over today to hang out with you. If we're gonna call ourselves the body of Christ, then we gotta care about people. Every kind of person. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't anymore write the law of God on stone tablets. The Holy Spirit writes the law of God on our hearts. And I believe if we love people well, and we're less concerned about whether they immediately start living it out and acting the right way and stop doing this and stop doing that, that the Holy Spirit will come and write his law on their hearts. And he'll teach people how to serve God in a way that pleases God. I want you to know today that there's a grace that is extended to you in Christ Jesus for your situation. There is a Sabbath rest for your soul that is available in Christ. And other religions try to search it out through Middle Eastern traditions and meditation and they're looking for the same thing. But that rest is only established through the Father. And the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. The only way. It's not there's many different ways up the mountain, you know, find whatever fits you, put the religious pieces together in a way that fits your worldview. Man, I do not want to live according to what Josh thinks is best because my insight is so minimal. I want the Sabbath rest that comes from knowing God. And that's established from him. Jesus proclaims this and then he proves it. He could have said, hey guy with the deformed hand, uh, just come with me and we'll leave together and I'm gonna heal you in private so nobody knows. Don't wanna disrupt the system. He could have said, hey, we're gonna wait six hours, you and me, we're gonna sit here and as soon as the Sabbath is over, I'm gonna heal you. But instead, what does he do? He calls the guy up, he says, hey, you here, up in front of everybody. And then I love the audacity of Jesus. He looks every one of his critics in the eye and then he heals the guy. There's no pew in miracles either, I don't know. And he heals the man in front of everybody and he forces them into the same decision that you and I have to make today. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Because now, not only is he proclaiming it, but the power of God has just confirmed what Jesus is saying. And he says, the son of man is also the son of God. And the religious leaders, instead of taking Jesus at his word, accepting him as the Messiah and beginning to do good with the power they had, they schemed together and figured out what they could do to Jesus to protect themselves. And Jesus forces you and I into the same decision when he works in our hearts and he works in our lives. When his Sabbath rest proves true, what is his Sabbath rest for you and I today? The Bible tells us if you confess Jesus as Lord of your life and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not by your works, not by your own ability, but where you end in your own ability and God takes over and you have to trust him for the rest, that's his rest where you have a a time of giving in church and you're able to give out of your own finance and your own wealth, saying, I think God can do more with 90% in my hands than I can do with 100% in, in my hands, you've just given into his rest. When you fast, like the Bible tells us to give up eating once in a while, to pray instead, and you say, you know what, I know that I could have physical nourishment, but right now I'm gonna seek out spiritual nourishment, and God meets that need, you've just entered his rest. When you follow the commands of God, they are not orders from heaven that you have to do to please God. They are the overflow of trusting him. And they establish a spiritual rest in our hearts. This is why we practice what we believe. It's what Jesus established. Man, I don't want anybody to walk away thinking I gotta do this and this and this and this. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And then allowing the rest of your life to be an overflow of that faith. 
The person who experiences God's rest is the one who has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Come on, and I know there's some people here, you need to stop working so hard like it depends on you. You need to take a day off and enjoy your family. You need to take a day off and let your body rest, trusting that God is gonna care for you as you trust him. I pray that you'll make decisions today that would say, not my own strength, but I'm gonna enter into his rest, into his blessing, into all that he has for me. And what's the result? People that are hungry get fed. People that need a miracle see the power of God. It's about entering into the rest that he has for each one of us. And Jesus is still giving a spiritual rest for the heart today. The religious leaders didn't have it. The Jewish people who don't confess Jesus as the Messiah are still living without it. Other religions of the world who claim to bring you peace of mind and balance are searching for it. It's a peace and a rest and a trust that comes from having peace in your heart with God and peace with God and freedom from our sin. A sinner being made right with God is only possible because Jesus took the old law that said you have to sacrifice animals, you have to live this way in order to put off the wrath of God. And Jesus sacrificed himself and paid the full penalty of our sin so you and I could live at peace with God. Peace with God because of Christ is the starting point, not something that you end up at. The moment you accept Christ, you're in right relationship with the Father again, and now you just have to live it out. And that's the offer of God's rest that's been extended to you and to me today. Will you stand with me? We're gonna sing this song as we close today. And it, it says these words. Jesus, you alone. Jesus, you alone. And for just a moment before you leave, for the person, listen, I know there's a place for having good life skills and a good budget and going to the doctor and whatever you need to do to like put life in order. But ultimately at the core of our being, there has to be a confession that says, Jesus, you alone. in the midst of the chaos that you and I live in, I pray that God would extend to you a rest for your soul. So all across this place, will you close your eyes? And if this message applies to you in some way, maybe you need to enter into a relationship with Jesus for the first time. As a sign of your surrender, will you lift your hands with mine? Maybe you're saying, my life has been chaos and nerves and there's been all this stuff going on inside of me. I've been trying to do it according to my own strength. And today I need to enter into God's rest. Will you lift your hands as well? Father, we just confess today that it's you alone who brings peace to the human soul. And as we turn to you right now, your word promises, your scripture promises that your spirit is gonna come and begin to do a work in us. And he's gonna establish peace. He's gonna establish the fruit of the spirit. He's going to establish the reign of our heavenly father in our lives. And so Jesus, we say, Jesus, you alone. Come and save us from ourselves, save us from our sin. We confess that you're both the Son of Man and the Son of God. And we take you at your word today. Come on, if you believe it, will you say amen with me? Amen, amen. Praise God, he's a good God, isn't he? We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.